the book of Galatians, written by the Apostle Paul. Hey, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good, good to see you guys. Uh, glad that we can be here together today, even if it's um, being survivors of daylight savings time. We're going we're gonna to get through this. Uh, we're going to do it together. Uh, so anyway, this morning I um, is not as, not as pumped up as I usually am, so I apologize. I'm going to try to see if God word can, words can pump me up a little bit here, but that lack of sleep is definitely getting a little, uh, getting to you. So um, once again, my name, my name is Kirk. I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and if you are visiting with us, thanks for coming out here today. Thanks for being a part of uh, what we're doing here at this church service. And just to kind of let you know what we do as a church, uh, I was thinking about this week, it was kind of, we kind of, each week is kind of like a church, like, kind of like a family reunion, all right, um, where we're going to, we, you know, there's music there, there's things like, uh, you know, connecting together, talking to one another, catching up, and there's things like, like learning, right? There's, there's learning. Sometimes you learn some things when you go to a family reunion. Typically, it's from like some crazy uncle's escapades or something like that, but we hear what we do is we learn from the Bible, um, which is probably a little bit, there's a little more wisdom in that than probably crazy uncles. I apologize to crazy uncles if you're out there today. But uh, what we do, though, is we study and we learn together through reading books of the Bible, through reading the, the passage together, through going line by line, through uh, having a thing like a message where we teach a little bit. I'll do that just in a little bit. But we also do that throughout the week as well as we Join together in these smaller families, these connect groups like Corey was talking about. Uh, just another way to unpack and really dive in together into God's word and to kind of learn more and more uh, what, what he's desiring to, to tell us and to show us. Uh, so if, if you're not in one of those groups, I would definitely encourage you to take a step towards one of those groups. We can get you connected to that um, today. Just uh, come see us after service. Um, and so today we're going to be, as, as my friend Jim uh, read, who's in my connect group, love that guy, uh, as he read Galatians chapter 4, uh, 8 through 20, we're going to be looking at this theme that is actually pretty pronounced throughout the whole letter of Gal- uh, to, to, Galatia, to the churches in Galatia. And this theme, there's, there's a few different themes, but this theme is really, um, it actually might be a title of this portion of, of your passage, depending on what Bible you have. But it, it would say something like, Paul's concern for the Galatians, or um, something like, I, I have a concern, I am concerned. That's really what this passage here is about. It's about concerned. Paul is being concerned. And so what is Paul concerned about? Well, we're going to get to that in a minute. But before we head there, my, my thought is that I think that we probably all at some point have stumbled across or heard those words, or maybe delivered those words of I am concerned or we are concerned. I, it's, I don't usually like to make absolute statements, but I think if you've lived uh, life of a human, you probably have run into someone who maybe has pushed back, or maybe you've been the one who's pushed back on that. And so I was thinking about the, my most memorable I, or we have some concern moment in, in my life this week. And what came to mind was my, uh, I think it was late 90s, I was graduating high school, and my friends and I, we had decided that we were going to kind of close out our high school career with a bang. And, uh, you know, before we left for college, we wanted to do something incredible. So what we decided to do is we were going to go cross country. We were going to go cross country. It was going to be amazing. Now, can you, anybody guess who had the, we have a concern statement? Anybody? Yeah, my parents. Yep, if you, if you guessed my parents, you are correct. And now they shared this, not because they were against us traveling across this great land. They shared this because of the the, the mode or the form of transportation we were choosing to utilize to get us across this wonderful land of America. And uh, the the form of transportation we decided to use was uh, there was a a hot dog truck that had been left in my backyard. My dad was known to like, I don't know, just 
he, people just drop things at our house randomly. I don't know how to explain it. But there was a hot dog truck that had been sitting there for about two years. And so my friends and I were like, that's, that's what's going to happen. We're going to take this hot dog truck. We're going to sell hot dogs cross country. It's going to be the greatest time of our lives. Now, what we uh, ran across was that my parents... They were a little bit wiser than we were, and they saw some things that maybe we didn't see. And so they shared this thing like, well, we have concerns. And so they listed their concerns. Some of the concerns were, well, maybe the, the, the fact that this hot dog truck had, truck had been like stagnant in our backyard, unable to, to start for the last like two years. That was one concern. Um, they were concerned because the way that we thought we were going to fund this, this venture was through selling hot dogs. And, you know, we had no idea like what how to project hot dog sales cross country. Like nobody really like sat down and figured that out. That was another concern. Uh, another concern was that none of us actually knew how to uh, f- automotively any- fix anything, do anything like that. And so for us, we're like 17 year olds. We're like, let's go. This is going to be amazing. And yet my parents graciously sat us down and said, hey, we, we, we have some concerns. This, uh, this trip, this on like down the hot dog highway, like this, this could not, uh, this could possibly turn out not the way you'd hoped it to. And I was thankful for my parents' wisdom. Um, at the moment, I, I wasn't as thankful, but as I look back now, I'm thankful that they didn't let us uh, take off in that kind of that hot dog uh, cart thing, whatever, that probably would have broken down right on Route 80, probably like by the Blairstown exit, probably would have blown up right there, some sort of like uh, Frankfurter in, Inferno or something like that. And so really glad that they stepped in and they said, hey, we have some concerns. And so here's what we're going to see today. Paul, in the same way, he's gonna, not that he has to go gather some teenagers from a pilgrimage, but he's going to speak to this church in Galatia, and he's going to share, hey, we have, I have some concerns. I have some concerns. And so the specific concerns that we're going to see him talk about, are, are, it's twofold. He's concerned about the, the foundation of this group, of this church, and he's concerned about the formation of this group. So foundation and formation. Verses 8 through 11, we'll see he's going to acknowledge this foundation of, of, of their faith, and he's concerned about it. And then we're going to see in verses 12 through 20, he's going to express the concern for the formation, how they're being formed. And so what I want to do is I want to just challenge us today as well. Are, are, there, are there things that we may need to be concerned or show some concern for in, in our foundation of our faith or our formation of our faith? Right, so when it comes to the foundation and form, for, formation, should, are there moments where we need to just kind of maybe show some concern? And if we do find ourselves seeing some concern, the, the great news is, well, it's, it's the gospel. Right? The gospel is the solution for this, 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 these concerns. And that's what, what Paul's going to point out. And so what I want to share is a few things. Paul, he's not looking to just... Uh, find fault with this group just because he's just bored or anything like that, right? Here's what Paul has. Paul has a really high view of the gospel. He values the gospel in incredible ways. And so his concerns are these. Ultimately, uh, he, they're rooted in keeping this, this, these churches from, from stepping away from the good news of the gospel as their foundation. That, that's what he's, he's going. He's, he's, he's nervous that there's this danger that they're moving away from the gospel as the primary space of their faith. The gospel is that just that, right? Because there's an importance to recognize the gospel is absolutely primary to the Christian faith. And so if we start to shift from that, if we see that we're shifting from the gospel to something other than the gospel, well, here's what we should, we sh- we should be, maybe be concerned. Or if our formation starts to shift from something other than the gospel, well, maybe we should also say we we may have some concerns. Okay, so let's start with the concerns for the the foundations of the faith that Paul talks about here, verses 8 through 11. And why why the concern for foundation of faith? Why, Why is Paul concerned about this? Here's why. Paul wants to remind them that, that the faith that's founded upon the gospel, what it offers is true liberation, true freedom, true liberation. And what that means, that means it allows us to experience a personal relationship with God. 
What it really is saying is liberation, it offers these relations. And so personal Meaning, I love this, that we can know and be known by the God who actually created us. That's an incredible, mind-blowing thing. And so the, the concern arises when the foundation of their faith, when it shifts from looking at the God who created us to this shift right here of being founded on created things, the created things around us. And really, here's the concern, is when some sort of impersonal creation that controls our relations. That's what Paul's concerned. He's concerned that these churches in Galatia, that their foundation, it was shifting because he presented them with a foundation that was in the gospel. And so how does he see this? What does Paul, how does he make this judgment? Well, he, he recognized that after they come to know the reality that they can have this unconditional personal relationship with the God who created them, all through what Jesus has offered, all through what Jesus has done. Sadly, what's happening in this group? Well, they're being drawn back to the conditions that they had formerly found themselves existing in, formerly operating before they knew that this God in a personal way. Right? It's, it's a life that's from now like a created thing, which we see in throughout is the law. It's, it's the law. And so basically... Here's his concern. You've been given access through Jesus' work on the cross to enjoy, that's a word you need to put there, enjoy this relationship with the God who created everything, right? A God who offers you life in abundance, this God who actually has a name, his name is Jesus, right? Yahweh, this great I am. But after receiving this incredible offer, now you, there's this, this new group that's come to town, and they're going to present some other offer, and they're telling you, well, you still need these created things. You still need these things to have access. You need the works. You need the customs. You need the ritual in order to keep some sort of relationship to get right with God, which is the complete opposite of Paul's message in, in the gospel. And so here's what, what he's saying. He's like, you're giving up relational access to return to relational restrictions. That's what he's saying. To, to trust, to, to exist once again and entangled by the demands that come from trying to, to, to find a foundation that's built or meaning or a purpose from the creative things of this world and not from the creator of this world. Really what, what he's saying is you're, you're seeking from creation what only Jesus can give it's this life in abundance. It's this forgiveness, this forgiveness of sin. It's this redemption. It's this restored relationship to the God of creation. And, and Paul's going to start this portion by actually speaking into creation, by drawing out creation. And he's going to point out his concern by addressing that, just that thing, that creation. Now, I want to be really clear when he talks about creation. Creation for Paul it's not, it's not a negative. However, some have viewed this, this portion right here as Paul having some sort of like anti-nature, anti-creation kind of worldview. And why, why do they see that? Well, Paul, he uses terms like enslaved by nature that, that were, are not God's. He says things like weak and worthless. He says elementary principles of the world. He even says you observe days, you observe months, seasons, and he says, I'm concerned. And so at times, many will take these verses, and they'll be like, Paul doesn't care about the created world. Or, you know, Paul's just seeing some sort of like anti-creation view of, of the world. And if that's what we're, we're taking away, that's a really poor interpretation of Paul's heart. It's a, Paul, it's, a, it's a poor interpretation of, of Pauline theology in general. So what is Paul addressing? What is he saying as he, he uses these, these terms of, of, of creation that seem so negative? Here's what he's addressing. He's addressing the concern of the level of value, the level of value that he, people place on the created things of this world. That's what Paul's concerned. He's also acknowledging the trap of, of, of Satan to take what God meant for us to enjoy, his, typically his creation, and then confuse that offering of enjoyment with some sort of offering of like, well, that's fulfillment now. That's fulfillment. 
That's foundation. And, and, and confuse us as, as, as his creation, as God's creation. And, and so Paul points out, if fulfillment, if foundation, if, if that's the goal, here, here's, here's the thing, I have some concerns. I have concerns. And my concerns are that, well, seeking from foundation, for foundation from creation, in seeking, what happens if we become entangled we become ensnared. We become enslaved to the created things. What we're doing is we're demanding from them something they're, they're not able to produce. They're not able to, to give us. And the results are, well, they're, they're, not, they're not great results. It's not good. So, for instance, something like um, the, I would say, the, uh, the approval of other humans or affirmation from others well, here's the thing. God created us to celebrate. So first and foremost, we celebrate him. But he also allows us to celebrate others, right? Other created things. And God's design is, is enjoyment in affirmation, in adoration, right? First is enjoyment, adoration of him, and then, each, and then each other. But here's what happens. Satan distorts that design of celebration, that design of, of approval and distorts it to now become worshiping one another, worshiping the, the, the creation, right? Enslavement of needing adoration from each other. So something that was good, right? Celebrating created things now becomes something, I would say, enslaving. We, we see this reality in things like codependency or like, like people pleasing. Right? Here's the thing, serving one another, celebrating one another, like, uh, it, uh, that's a great thing. Affirming one another is, is good. It's to be enjoyed. But the distorted view, the distorted view of that celebration is, is when we see that we want a foundation in that, well, that enslaves. That entangles. Right? It entangles people to, to place their, well, if I'm not liked or if I'm not adored by everyone, or if I'm not the fulfillment of that other person, then I can't be fulfilled. Then I can't enjoy who I am. And that's a concern for, for our foundation. Because that, that's a shaky foundation. That's a, that's a shaky one because it's dependent on really things like our performance or the performance of, of other people, right? And that, that becomes dangerous. But here's what Paul presents in the gospel. He says we're offered this full acceptance to be fully loved. At, at the heart of the gospel is this firm, never shifting foundation of love of God. It's a truth that states what we see in 1 John that we love because he first loved us. And so when we can walk in the light of, that, of God's unconditional love, here's what happens. We can then love without demanding this additional approval or validation of others. And so one of Paul's concerns is seeking from creation a, a love that only can be found through the creator in the gospel. Seeking foundation outside of God's love in the gospel. That's his, that's his first concern. So, so then Paul, he goes on to acknowledge things like rituals, and celebrations, and observing days, and months, and seasons. Now, now, once again, Paul isn't some sort of, like, hater. He's not, like, bah humbug. He's not, like, stop celebrating. That's, that's not at all. He, he's not even, like, making a case like some religious presentations do where practice is, like, prohibited against birthdays or, like, celebrations. That's not what he's doing. Paul's concern, it's not about the rituals themselves. His concern is regards to the level of value that's placed upon these rituals. That's his concern. He's concerned that these rituals have now become the foundation for the, the lives of this truth, of, the, of this, this church. But he's not anti-ritual. Paul is aware that rituals, well, they actually exist in everyone's life. It, it's true. Maybe for some, maybe we call them routines. Maybe some of us, we call them disciplines. But rituals are present, and they, are, they display the foundation of our 
lives. Rituals are, are really, they're, they're ways in which we've determined to operate that express what's at the foundation of our lives. We, we, all, we all have rituals, right? Rituals in the way that we spend our money. Rituals in who we decide to spend and hang out with, right? Rituals in the way we, we spend and use our time. What's valuable to us, right? We, we all operate in some sort of religious practice, some sort of rituals. It's true, even, even those who claim to not be religious, right? I'm not like a religious person. That, that's not actually true. Do you operate in routines? Do you have disciplines? Well, yeah. Okay, well then you're a religious person. You might not claim that you operate your life or your routines, that they're some sort of like deity or God. Like, oh, no one tells me what to do, right? But that's not actually true. The reality is you are the God. You are that God. You are that Lord in which your routines benefit, in which they show worship. Or maybe it's, it's a, your career. Maybe it's your aspirations, Maybe it's just hobbies. Whatever you base your daily rituals on, that's your religion. That's your God. And your life, it consists of rituals, of routine, which really, that's that's a clear set of values, of rules, of procedures. Like even for those who choose to do no, like a, nothing at all, like they're anti-establishment, right? Your, your rituals of, of nothingness, here's what they are. They're still declarations of your faith. Down with the man. Well, that, that's still a statement of your faith. And then you develop routines that declare you some sort of nonconformist. Well, what are those? Those are rituals, right? Here's the thing. Rituals, they're the dogmas of your foundation, of your faith. Just, a, just an example, something like, like status. That might be your religion. Maybe your desire to be um, known or uh, be, you know, to, to maintain a certain status at school or in a, uh, your job or your neighborhood or relationship. Well, Maintaining that status, the le- that, the, that level, that, that, that becomes the foundation for your belief system. And so that means you're going to like uh, follow routines or rituals to help you stay devoted to that foundation. You'll buy the newest clothes. You'll hop on the, the, the newest trends. You'll get fit. All, all, all what? All, these are rituals. And so the point to, is, is, is to see this desired created experience that shows the foundation of our life. And so ritual foundations can take, they can take so many different forms. Th- things like, um, for some, religion is, is, is family, right? especially in North Jersey. Right? Not, not many people stick around for the high property taxes. It's that most people stick around for the value of, of family. And then family becomes these, these rituals and these routines and everything's based on family as foundation. It's the family first mentality. Now, now, Paul isn't against family. We're not against family or rituals, routines. Here's his concerns. He's saying none of those things will ever provide what only the gospel can. The ability to actually be known in an offering to truly know who is at the foundation of your belief system. And to truly be known what, by him. So here, here's his concern. Well, created things, when, when placed in the role of where only God should be, that, that doesn't actually allow you liberation or freedom to fully experience the joy in that foundation. To be fully known. As we are. And being fully received fully known, well, Paul, Paul's going to remind us that that's something only the God of creation can actually offer. Here's, here's what happens when we chase these created things for what only God truly offers. Well, because we can't fully be known, 
we can never fully live. We can never fully, freely live. We can't operate in who we actually are. Why? Because there's no space for things like being vulnerable or flawed or just being imperfect people. And in fact, our, our inability to live as fully known, that ultimately what happens is that keeps us in bondage. That keeps us held there. We're always concerned. We're always worried. Am I going to measure up? What if someone finds out the real me? Anybody? And Paul, he's concerned because the Galatians, he says, at one time had come to know the beauty of actually being known by God. He says this in in verse 8. He says, I'm concerned because there was a time when you didn't know God, but praise God, but then you became aware of this God of creation who can be known. And what's even crazier is that in Christ, because of Christ Jesus, you've been made aware that this God knows you. He's always known you. And if that isn't enough, right, wait, wait, there's more, right? He desires for us to fully be known by him forever. So here's what what Paul's pointing out. He's saying God knows you. Creation, creation can never fully know the real you. Creation knows how to enslave you, how to keep you in bondage, but creation, it doesn't allow you to fully be known. But God does. He knows the real you, and he still, after knowing that he still desires to be in relationship with you, to forgive you. It reminds me of Psalm 139. It says this, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you knew it all together. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hands upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. For you form my inner parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Skip to verse 14. It says, I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of the days that formed me, when as yet there was none of them. Here's Paul's concern. This group has seen They've seen the the way. They've seen the truth. They've seen the light. They've come to understand a God who meets them where they're at, who's rescued them from the entrapment of the bondage of, of sin, the enslavement of the created things of this world, and yet they want to what? They want to go back to captivity. They want to go back into captivity. Here's what they want to do. They want to go back to Egypt. They want to go back into Egypt. Now, we might need some context for, for that. Um, what I'm referencing, um, Egypt is a, seems like a really great place. I've never been there myself. But w- the reference is in regards to the Israelite people and a time in history when they were enslaved by the Egyptians. This time where Moses and, and the Exodus, where God uses Moses to, to lead God's people out of the bondage, that, the, the bondage of the created things, which are known as the Egyptians. And God desires to lead his people into the promised land under the care of of himself. But here's what happens. Well, the group of Israelites, they're freed from captivity. Well, they start to experience hardships. And they lose sight of God. Here's what the we want to go back to Egypt concept looks like. It's when things in our journey to the promised land, they get tough. It's when hardships start taking place when we're met with challenges, and instead of trusting that God's plan is good and it's for you, we want to go back to these created things that we know. Where where, where God is calling us to trust, not in what is seen, but in him, and put our faith in what is unseen. Well, we'd rather place our trust in the objects that we know, that we see, even if those objects enslave us. That's, that's what we see in this account in the Old Testament. This group, 
They're actually being called to put their faith and their trust in, in something, in someone unseen. And well, what happens is they start to grumble. They want to go back to slavery. Look at the book of Numbers. It says this. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we have died in the land of Egypt, or that we had died in the wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and little ones will become prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, Let's choose a leader and go back to Egypt. So here's the thing. Formerly, this group, they didn't know God. They were enslaved to Pharaoh, who is this created being. Yet this personal God intervenes on their behalf. And don't miss how he intervenes. It's incredible. He intervenes by putting his power over creation on display. Like, like the, the plagues, part in the Red Sea. What, what does God do? What is he showing? He's showing the hierarchy of the relationship between the creation and the creator. That creation does not control the creator. It's the creator who speaks. It's the creation that listens. And this group of Israelites, they've, they've seen God's power over creation. But as soon as things don't play out, they don't play out the way that they wanted or they desired, well, things get hard when the creator's asking them to listen, to trust, to depend They want to return to bondage, even if it's painful. Even, it's it's what they know. It's what's foundational. Even in the discomfort, somehow they think they're going to find comfort. And yet I I think how often I find myself in that same space. And so Paul's concern for this group in Galatia is they've returned to, to the offerings of relationless gods. These are relationless because they can't fully know us. We can't ever fully be known. We can only uh, appease. We can attempt to believe that they may bring some sort of like fulfillment that we desire and maybe give us opportunities. And, and it's true, like your career or, or your position of employment, the reality is there might be some offerings of opportunities. That's absolutely true. You may be able to advance. You might be able to uh, make a ton of money. Maybe get a management executive level, right? But here's the thing. What that career, what that position won't and can't offer is for you to actually be known for who you are. There's a part of you that can be recognized Maybe it's your work ethic. Maybe it knows you have a spouse and a couple kids, right? But there's, 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 there's foundationally fully known. There's, there's no way. And if there was a way to be fully known, all of your thoughts, all of your uh, actions, even the ones that take place when the boss isn't looking, well, I, I wonder how many achievements we'd receive. Yet, yet Paul, he's declaring something incredible, that this Jesus is this mediator. He is this personal God who you are fully known by. You are fully known, not because of your work ethic, not because of your cool car, not because of your awesome house. No, he knows you because he created you. He, he formed you. He founded you. Here's a silly analogy, but since we're talking in, like, business lingo here, well, who's the founder of of Apple? Well, it's Steve Jobs, right? Okay, well, who's the founder of Steve Jobs? Well, the Bible says it's God. He's the foundation for all of humanity. He founded us all. He knows what we need. Why? Because he created us. Do do we find our foundation in this creator? Or are we just going from thing to thing, just seeking some sort of firm foundation? 
and thing to thing because we start to recognize that every time we place our faith in something besides God and this, un- and this created thing, like what happens? Well, it ends up falling apart. Maybe we lose our job. Maybe that person breaks up with us. Maybe we, we lose a, a loved one. And, and this is exactly what the prophet Jeremiah, he declares to God's people. He uses the analogy of, what, of what's called a broken cistern. He says this, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So what he's saying is any foundation apart from God himself, it's going gonna, it's gonna to leak. It, it's, it's, it's not even just going to leak, but the more we put our lives into it, those, those cisterns, those containers, they're actually going to burst. And, and the water that's, that's piling up in there, that's stagnant water. But look what God offers. Fountains of living water. Flowing, active water. We bought our house a couple years ago. It came with a, a pond, a little fish pond thing. And that wasn't why we bought it. Uh, in fact, um, when, when, it, when we first you know, bought it, it was nice. It was nice and flowing. And uh, sadly, there was no instructions on how to keep it nice and flowing. And uh, as time went on, the, the pump broke. And then, of course, the pump that we needed was discontinued, couldn't find it anywhere, so uh, we have some concerns, right? And so what are these concerns? Well, this rainwater is going to build up, overflow, overwhelm the, the, the actual pond itself, maybe even leak down to the driveway, cause some, some damage there, some cracks. And, of course, the stagnant water, well, that becomes a wonderful breeding ground for mosquitoes and other unhealthy uh, life environments. What was needed in that? Well, we needed water that was flowing, actively streams of water that, that knew our, our circumstances and what, what was best for us, flowing, living water. And, and the, these foundations of the created world, they don't satisfy. They don't fully know us. They can't actively know us and what we need. Only living water will satisfy. And here's the good news. Well, Jesus he offers that type of satisfaction. Look what it says, John 7, 37. On the last day of the feast, that great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And so here's Paul's concern, this foundation that was provided for life through the gospel. This group has, has become deceived and they're returning to their old ways this enticement that's found in creation. He's concerned that this, this group has fallen back to, into a foundation that's enslaved to creation rather than a foundation that's entrusted to the creator. So that's the first concern. Here's the second concern for this group. Verses 12 through 20, it's the formation of this group. And, and not just how they're formed, but how they're being cruciformed. Cruciformed. Now, now, cruciform isn't just like a one-up of like being formed. Uh, it kind of is, but it's not really. But what it is, it's, it's giving up ourselves for Christ, to Christ, to be formed by him, to be formed through him. And so Paul speaks in, in Galatians 2.20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So cruciformity is this, it's lowering ourselves and raising up Christ. And Paul, he's calling for lives that are to be cruciformed. That's what he's desiring when he says in verse 12, he says, um, be like I am. And it's important to point out that Paul is referring to something more than imitation and imitating him. And, and I, I recognize Paul does use that term imitating uh, in other contexts. I think in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he says, be imitators of me as, as I am Christ. And, of course, we see uh, just really value in imitation. According to Oscar Wilde, right, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery that mediocre can pay great to greatness. So there's a space for imitation. But what Paul is calling for is this formation, specifically cruciform. Because here's just an example of, uh, of just imitation. So when I was a kid, I, um, I loved playing basketball. I still, I still do a lot. And, and I love this player named Michael Jordan. You guys have probably heard of him. I wasn't, I wasn't alone. There was actually a song that we sang as kids. 
like Mike. Anybody remember it? I could be like, it's just me. Okay, cool. Um, but anyway, that song would be on in my brain, right, as I started to play basketball. And then MJ had this other signature move where he'd have his tongue out while he's playing. And, and so, you know, just like a hound dog or something like that. And so when I get on the court, five foot, 110, buck 10 maybe, 12 real me, imitating MJ, right? And maybe others were imitating the other MJ, did some moonwalking, had a little white glove, I don't know. But uh, basically what happened is, well, I'm trying to imitate the superstar athlete. Well, let's be honest. As much as I imitated MJ, I'm not sure if you guys could tell, I was not even close to being like MJ. And so imitation, it's helpful, but it's limited. Formation, however, is different. Because formation, it's built upon its foundation, It's the foundation that shapes it. And that's why Paul, he's so concerned, first, in regards to the foundation of this group. Because what happens, it is essential to its formation of this people group. And Paul, he knows he's provided them with a firm foundation. This gospel message. A foundation that's built on the rock of ages. Not on some sort of sinking sand. So Paul's concern is their formation. It's not... It's not evidence of their foundation. The structure, it doesn't match the foundation. I don't know a ton about building, but I do know that if you have a foundation that's been laid, well, that you need to build upon that foundation, really something that's reflective and matches that. So for instance, if you're going to uh, pour a foundation for a tiny house, and you decided that you wanted to build a skyscraper on that, well, we we have some concerns. And that's what Paul's noticing. This foundation that was poured from Jesus pouring out his blood for forgiveness of sins, a foundation that was built on sacrificial relational love, well, the structure that's being assembled, the construction is not matching the foundation. And so he has some concerns. So how, how does Paul notice this? How does he notice at the foundation there's, there's a, a disconnect here? If you look at verses 13 through 16, Paul, he makes a series of really interesting statements. And, and without context, they can seem really, really weird and odd. He says things like, um, you, you have received the gospel in spite of my bodily ailment. Like, it's a weird statement. But what Paul is pointing out is that the, res- the way he was received by this group, it initially showed cruciformity. And so once again, what, what is this cruciformity? It's, it's lowering oneself, it's like raising up Christ. So what about Paul's condition and his ailment shows that there was once fruit of cruciformity of this church? Well, he- here's how. The church at one time welcomed him as they did as they welcomed Christ. How do we see that? Well, Paul's story shows us that. Paul's story includes being uh, shipwrecked, being uh, beaten, being stoned, and and his ailing body, that's the result of sufferings. Now, here's the thing that's important to point out. Paul's condition should have been a a deterrent to this Greco-Roman culture. The the churches in the regions of Galatia, by all cultural standards, here's what should have been. They should not have welcomed him. They should not have received him. They should definitely not have put him in a place of authority. But I love God's kingdom is so upside down and so countercultural. See, the Greco-Roman perspective at this time would have been seen as physiognomy. And what that is, I'm sure we're all familiar. But physiognomy, what it does, it it involves the uh, assumed assumption between outward appearance and inner character. Basically, a body and a soul are connected. One tells you about the other. So if that person's physical condition was scarred or mutilated on the back of his body, well, that person had no value. That person, in fact, was was weak. Now, what's interesting, if that person had scars in the front of their body, that actually meant that you were a warrior. You're victorious. But scars, scars on the back meant you'd been like fleeing from some sort of attack or, or punishment. It meant that you were weak. But this group... This church welcomed the ones who would have been recognized as weak. Paul in his ailments, just like the beaten and bruised Jesus. Paul was sharing in the sufferings of Christ, and they didn't despise him. 
they welcomed him. And so Paul's concern is that their current reception of this teaching, it doesn't reflect the formation of this initial reception. There's a disconnect. Which, listen, we, we might need to do a quick call for any sort of similar concerns in our own lives. Our, our, our foundation calls us to welcome one another as Christ has welcomed us. So I think we should get a jump on this, this area now. This may have like a future power to derail our, our, form, our, our formation. We're, we're like, um, I don't know, seven months away from our next presidential election. So, so listen, what, what we mean, might need to ask ourselves, if my passion for my candidate causes me to lose my love for my neighbor, even keeps me away from the command of loving my enemy, praying for those who persecute me, well, that might be a concern. My house, it might be falling off its foundation. Right? So if your, for, if your, if your, your uh, formation leans more left or leans more right than it does in the direction of being a humble servant, that's a faulty foundation. And so if that's you, I want to offer for all of us, God's word to, to keep us grounded. Philippians 2, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more si- significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but the interest of others. Have this mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. I, I love this verse because it's this example of not just being formed, but transformed. This, this humbling, it's emptying ourselves. It's, it's, it's cruciformed. It's cruciformed. So here's just a helpful question. When it comes to this political conversation, What's at the core of my foundation? Is it an ideology or is it Christology? Is it Christ? Okay, jump to verse 16 real quick. Paul makes this strange claim about the love for him. It was like going so far as gouging out their eyes. What in the world is he talking about, gouging out their eyes? Here's what he's referring to. It's this Scythian myth of a, a story of a guy named Mandamus. And Mandamus, he sought to find the release of a, of a friend from these, these soldiers. And, and Mandamus, he didn't have anything to give them. He couldn't trade any, have any goods or anything like that. And so the soldiers, they baited him and said, give us your eyes. Give us your eyes. And so what Mandamus does, out of love, he accepts their offer to gouge out his eyes. Now why is Paul reference, refer, uh, referencing this? Well, that's the kind of love and devotion that was once shared by Paul and this community. It was that level. They'd sacrifice for him and vice versa. And so Paul, he has concerns because there's no longer evidence of this cruciform, sacrificial love that was previously received. And so that's, that's Paul's concern. Like the, it's, it's just, it's like the, to quote the, you know, Black Eyed Peas, Justin Timberlake collab, where's the love? That's what he's asking. And not some sort of obligatory love, but this deep, cruciformed, sacrificial love like First John talks about. By this we know love. He laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's good and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So here's the reality for us. As we read this verse, as we recognize the depth of love that's founded upon Christ Jesus, even as we look around at this church family, do do we have any concerns over the level of cruciform love that's on display for one another? We we might state that we, we love one another, but do we see each other from this lens of cruciformed love. Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest, I, I, I desire to, but, but I know I fall really, really short in that type of love. So here's how I want to close our time. Maybe today we uh, resonate with some of these concerns in our lives. Maybe it's the, the foundation we've being built, or maybe it's the formation. What I want to share is, here's Paul's concern. It's not 
get yourself right. It's not do the right thing. It's not a moral uh, consideration. He actually speaks kind of against the law works mentality. His concern is a foundation that's built on the wrong things, which then leads to the formation that focuses on the wrong things. It's all about where we're being built, who we're built upon. Same message Jesus gives in Matthew 7. It says, everyone who hears these words of mine does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain fell, floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears the words of mine does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So the foundation of the fool is, is, is what? Well, Proverbs tells us the fool says in his heart, there is no God. That's the foundation of the fool. But what's the foundation of the wise men built upon? Well, back to Proverbs 18.2. It says, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. It's built on, it's built on the, the rock, Right? The different rock, way before Dwayne Johnson was knit in his mother's womb, right? This is the rock of Jesus. This rock was rescued, that, that has protected, this refuge. It's this rescuing rock. It's the foundation in which a follower of Jesus stands. And it's not because of efforts, achievements, but it's because of Christ's work on our behalf that we can receive through the gospel. That's the foundation. That's the formation. Let's pray that we can go out and... Um, and apply that this week. God, uh, thank you for giving us a, a, a firm foundation, Lord, to, to turn to, to, to be built upon, Lord Jesus. Thank you that your truth, Lord, you're the way. God, that there is life in you. God, would you help us today to just process where, where we may have some concerns, Lord, of, of just our foundation, maybe not evidencing in our, our formation, God. Would you Help us to see that not in a shameful way, Lord, but just in a consideration, Lord, of where we can bring, bring that to you, Lord, where we can find that you will work uh, in us, Lord, and through us, God. God, thank you that you are a God of, of grace who welcomes us, Lord, even in our, our uh, moments where we, we fall short, where we've maybe leaned a certain direction for our formation inside of you, that you welcome us back, or that you desire us to come back to you. God, thank you that we can... Um, just trust you in that, Lord. Um, thank you that we have one another that we can also turn to, Lord, to just help us, to, to help us if we see something that's kind of pointing us in the wrong direction, God, to, to just steer us back, back to you, Jesus. God, we love you so much. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.